Welcome to The Power of Faith with Dr. Leroy Logan, MBE, and the Right Reverend Rose Hudson Wilkin, CD, MBE. I'm Ruth O'Reilly Smith, and I'm going to be your host this evening. Tonight, we'll be discussing The Power of Faith how to triumph in challenging times. Let me start by introducing you to our guests for tonight. Dr. Leroy Logan is a former superintendent in the Metropolitan Police and one of the founder members of the Black Police Association, serving as chair for 30 years before retiring in 2013. He was born in 1957 in Islington to Jamaican parents. Leroy is a proud Londoner and a strong advocate for good relationships between the police and Britain's minority ethnic communities. He's a passionate mentor of young people, a highly respected advisor on knife crime, and Leroy's autobiography, Closing Ranks, My Life as a Cop, was published this year. It charts a lifelong battle against prejudice and racism as one of the few black policemen in the London Met and how his faith has sustained him through challenging times. Leroy is married to Gretel and they have three children. Bishop Rose Hudson Wilkin is the first black woman to become a Church of England bishop. She was born in 1961 in Jamaica and was raised by her father and her aunt as her mother had traveled to England when she was born. Rose met her mother again when she was nine years old and at the age of 14 she sensed a call into ministry. Rose traveled to England at the age of 18, where she trained as an evangelist at the Church Army College in London. And this is where she met and married Ken, with whom she has three children. Rose was one of the first women to be ordained, the first black priest to be chaplain to the Queen and to the Speaker of the House of Commons. And she is now the first black woman bishop of Dover. Just like Leroy, Bishop Rose too had to battle prejudice and racism, and this time within the church, which she loves and among the people she feels called to serve. These two friends share many parallels in their stories, but what seems to be most significant in enabling them both to remain devoted to their calling in the midst of great challenge and hardship is their unwavering faith in a God who has sustained them through it all. A very good evening, Dr. Leroy and Bishop Rose Hudson Wilkin. Yes. Hello, good evening. Greetings. Thank you Great so much for here. joining us tonight. Leroy, let, let's start with you. So you were working in science and research when your call to join the police caught you a bit off guard. So tell us what happened. There were quite a few people who said, yes, this is definitely something you need to go for. But there were a lot of people who were also against the idea, including your own father? Yeah, basically, I um, was um, working at the Royal Free Hospital. Uh, that was my first job after getting my degree in uh, pharmacology. And as a result of that, I somehow got befriended by police officers because the recreation centre at the Royal Free, where we had our gym, our swimming pool, and even the bar, I, I would see these uh, young men and I was similar age and they would be talking to me. I didn't know they're police officers until they finally said, yeah, they're from the local police station in Hampstead. And I, so I saw the personal side of them uh, and, and the human side before I saw the uniform. Because my previous experience with police, even as a youngster growing up in London, was the sus law and the draconian policing. I even got stopped and searched in school. So I didn't have really um, high regard of police. But when I saw these officers, they offset a lot of my presumptions and stereotypes. And then I started to think back of when I was a youngster in Jamaica. I went there for a few years at primary school stage. And I remember seeing the blue seam and the red seam of the uh, Jamaican officers who looked really um, fit for purpose and very, um, you know, presentable and professional. And uh, I also remember when I was doing my degree, I saw a black officer over here in London. Uh, in East London, and um, he said his image of him in his uniform in a police car really resonated with me. I thought, what a brave person. So all these images came back, and then the officers said, well, why don't you take on a, a, a ride around? And I did that, and they convinced me this was the time to apply. And uh, this was confirmed by my wife, um, well, Gretel was my fiance at the time. She said, yeah, you should join. And uh, I had uh, my fr 
closest friend, Lee John. His mother was a community um, advocate, um, police liaison. She said, yep, you should join. And, and un unfortunately, <laughs> the person I was supposed to tell first, my dad, I didn't tell. And in between the process of applying and the interview, my father was badly assaulted by police. And I, I couldn't tell him. I said, how can I tell my dad that I'm going to join the ranks of the officers who beat him up? And, and, I, just, and I procrastinated until he found out the hard way when police officers knocked at his door. Um, because in those days, they would check your accommodation if you're applying. And even though I'd moved out and updated my new address, they went to the old address where my parents lived. And so my dad found out that way. And it was horrendous. Um, but to his great character and, and wisdom, he, he, he sort of validated me in the end and he assisted me to join. And, you know, he was with me till the end. And uh, yeah, in a nutshell, that's what happened. <laughs> what do you think, what do you think uh, Gretel and some of your friends saw in you that was different? In fact, your boss at the Royal Free said, you know, he could he could well imagine you being in the police. What yeah, do you think yeah. they saw? Yeah, that my, my boss, uh, Roy Pounder, he, he he actually said, well, you're a people person. I can't see you being stuck in a lab for 30 years. And, you know, you, you know, you should try something to do with people. And, and I said, what do you think I should do? And he said, oh, become a cop. And I thought to myself, do I look like a white racist? Do I look racist to you? And as a result of that, I was thinking, did he see me going around with those officers because they were taking me on a drive run? So, yeah, all that was just creating this calling and this desire to to join and to make changes. But I didn't know exactly how I was going to do it. But I sensed that the Lord was going to put me in the right place at the right time. And, and he definitely did that um, from my first week at Hendon all the way through my career. Bishop Rose, for you, your awareness of purpose came really early on in life. Tell us, you were age 14. Tell mm. us about that experience. What happened? Well, well, I refer to myself as a cradle Anglican. And by that, I mean, I was baptized before I was four months old at the St. James Parish Church in Montego Bay. So I sort of grew up in the church, as it were. And, uh, and and became very involved at a very young age because we didn't have enough priests to, to have a priest every Sunday at your service. And so the wise old lay reader got the young people involved in the services. And, and so I was approximately 14 when I had this overwhelming sense that this is what I was being called to, to serve as a minister of the gospel. Um, but at the time, of course, there were no women in ministry in the Anglican Church um, as as priest. And, uh, and, and I remember having a conversation with my bishop at the time. And my bishop basically said, oh, we're, we're Anglicans. We don't do that. <laughs> and, and I kept it. You know, there's that wonderful passage where it says that Mary kept in her heart uh, all that was being said of her and the child she was carrying. I sort of kept it in my heart. And my conversation with God then was, I believe that you have called me. So I'm just going to be faithful and you will have to do your part to make it happen. And it took such a long time for the church to say yes to women, such a long time. Do you remember the first time they said yes? Oh, my goodness. I was in um, Dean's Yard, you know, the, the synod, the general synod meets to discuss and to vote. And I was in Dean's Yard. There were tons of us in Dean's Yard singing and we couldn't get inside because we weren't on the synod. So we were singing and praying and dancing. And, and then it just trickled out that the vote was a yes. And, you know, the sad thing about it is that those inside the chamber were told that they were to receive the news in silence. I thank God that I was not inside, that I was outside because I was going <laughs> to praise God without any sense of being told to be hushed about it. Mm. And even today, I think women have always been left to, to feeling 
that, you know, don't get excited because there are some people who are not happy about you being a priest. So you need to, in, in other words, don't share your excitement because it will upset them. And I would love women to break free from that and to, to be joyful because actually the ministry is about joy. And, you know, we're in the season now, we're, well, it's, it's Advent still, we're getting nearer to Christmas, and that is a season of joy. So, you know, I want women, I want the church, I want Christians to be joyful. And one of the things that I say to folks is, if we're not joyful about our faith, then why on earth would anyone be attracted to it? Mm, yeah, absolutely. Do you remember the first person you were able to tell you hid these things deep in your heart? But I imagine when you first said you wanted to travel to England to study within the church, you would have had to tell somebody. <laughs> yes, I think um, I think my adopted dad, my adopted dad, and and but he was a he was a great man of God. He you know he. He believed in me. You know, you asked um, uh, my, my, my friend Leroy, you know, who, what did they see in him? My adopted dad saw that in me. He saw that Christian leadership. And so he was not surprised that that, that was there. Yes, that calling was there. Wow. Mm. wow, beautiful. Well, for both of you, your Christian faith uh, really made that calling clear, sustained you, it strengthened you during times of great pressure and trial. Uh, Leroy, Leroy, for you, the first 10 years were tough though. I mean, you you knew that this was something you needed to do and you did it, but it kind of felt like it was a chore, especially those 10 years. 10 years is a long time to do something that you know you're called to and to yeah. have it feel like a chore. Well, it was the hostile environment of the police culture, there was a lot of casual racism. And I I remember from the first week when I joined and you hear in the N word and the W word, and I'd left a, a lovely environment of science research at the Royal Free Hospital in the leafy suburbs of Hampstead, Heath. And, and I really questioned my sanity. I thought, why would I do that? And it continued throughout the foundation course, that 20 week foundation course. But I, I, again, I saw how the Lord sort of blessed me with um, a class captain who was uh, a Sandhurst instructor. And he wasn't uh, a Christian from, he never professed his, his faith, in fact. But he was like a mentor. He actually got me through Hendon <laughs> because we had adjoining rooms and I was made deputy class captain. So he taught me how to iron my trousers properly, pull up my shoes, shirts crisp, you know, look the part. And uh, I remember in the, the, the film that uh, recently had been done uh, with um, Steve McQueen, Red, White and Blue, it was the music that attracted him to, to know Tom. And, and, and Tom has recently got in touch with me saying, well, was that me? And I said, of course it was you, because, you know, uh, he had such a strong um, influence on me to get through and, and, and excel. And that was the thing I realized, even from my parents, that excellence is the best deterrent um, and not to be derailed by people's personalities or prejudices if i could be um excellent in my intellect my my physical prowess my spiritual strength and and my faith was my resilience to bounce back even when i had tough times i i, I you know i i would do well and, and i always said if i can get through the first two years i can get through the other 28 because when I left Hendon and went on to my first station at Islington, where I grew up, I knew the area. I felt confident in my ability to do well. But I had the worst reporting sergeant ever. I mean, he was consistent. He hated everyone. It wasn't because of your color of your skin or your gender or your faith or no faith. He just didn't like anyone. Oh, that's how he came across. And um, but I thought, well, this is he's like this is either going to make me or break me. But and the Lord showed up time and time again, even when they wrote the big N word on my locker and I, I could have, and it was in a secure area of the police station. And so it couldn't be a member of the public. And so it must be one of my colleagues. And that really tested me. But I thought, well, what do you expect? They're not going to um, open, be in open arms and let you just, oh, what a great person you are. Because they actually suspected me. They thought, you're a scientist, you're black, 
a graduate, why would you join? So they would, they would think, well, you're an undercover journalist or are you trying to write a book about us or something like that? Well, I suppose they were right because 30 odd years later, I wrote the book. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it was uh, a real hostile environment. That, that first 10 years, even when I got promoted and went to um, Edmonton, uh, again, I had to really show my leadership. And for me, having that um, pastoral element, not only in serving the needs of the community, but also my colleagues, so I'd go out my way to build bridges and, and, and not create barriers. The thing is, it wasn't with it wasn't only within the police force that you were, you know, seen as suspicious. People were suspicious of you. People didn't like you. It was within your own community. People were suspicious of you and wondering what on earth are you doing in the police force? Yeah, um, most of my family and friends. Um, that were close to me were, were supportive um even though my father was initially quite anti very anti but he he supported me to, to get through into the, the the police but yeah i i was called all sorts of names judas a coconut bounty and um in, in again in, in the red and white uh, red white and blue film um a young man ca called um john boyega um, Judas, and he says, Officer Judas to you. Well, I actually had that encounter with a, a young man who was, oh, he was one of my biggest challenges. And he wanted me to arrest him, but I wouldn't arrest him because one, I'm not going to run around for you. And I know even if you you try and taunt me, fail the attitude test, whatever, I, I, I could actually see myself in him. So I, I thought, well, actually, I might have been doing the same thing if I knew there was a local officer who looked like me. Let me test him out, you know. And um, so I, I, I would get all sorts of name called. But again, I had to show my my clear understanding that I'm a black man who happens to be a cop because here I am after 30 years. I'm still a black man. And so that meant I integrated into the culture not assimilate and adopt the norms and values so I was, I was clear that i wanted to make changes from within i knew that i had to make sure that people understand that i'm still the same person that joined and i again i want to make sure that the community feel that sense of well i'm an advocate on their behalf and they could i'm accessible so being on the streets and and patrolling on a regular basis was that my way of being an ambassador, not only for the Met, but also for my community. Could I, could I just add to say, uh, my brother Leroy, that I, ever since meeting you, I could see that you were someone who was comfortable in who you are. So although you've just said that I'm a black man and I still am a black man, actually, in reality, you are a man. And you, you, you knew that you, you didn't have to prove anything to anyone. And the fact that you were black was just an added bonus. Yeah, yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I felt really comfortable with it. I, I didn't feel any fear. Uh, I knew I was as good as my, my white counterparts, mm. even though I didn't get, you know, promotion as I should. I, I didn't get certain posts as I should, but I knew that I was as good as them, if not better, and I would show them how good I was. So, you know, I was comfortable in my own skin, and yeah. that was important. That showed. <laughs> Do you think the fact that you were a little bit older also made a difference? Yeah, that maybe if I was 18, 19, as a lot of the officers were, you know, in, especially in Hendon, in the recruits um, school, I could have been a, a lot more impressionable. But because I was 26, um, by this time I was married, um, my first child was on the way, and when I got to Islington, um, my first child was with us. So I, I had a lot more. My first ministry was the, my, my family, and and letting um, you know that they were the priority for me, and and, and providing for them, and and also um, I wasn't I, I wasn't living in police accommodation. So all all that 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 when you're in police accommodation, you, you there's a lot more tendency to. To, to really get into the culture. So I could go home away from the culture, come up for air as it were, speak to people that, you know, um, I grew up with and in the local neighborhood, you know, sort of real people, not, you know, just police officers. And, and as a result that it gave me that sort of critical distance not to, again, absorb the norms and values of the culture. And, 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 and for me, it, 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 it was um, 
for me, the, the, the lifeblood, you know, I, I was able to keep my firm, my feet firmly on the ground and, and not get caught up in the culture because it's, mm. it's easily done. Mm. Bishop Rose, for you, you know, the assumption is that we can almost appreciate the reality of uh, an industry, if you like, the police force, the Met Office that's changing slowly, has done over the years, you know, and the, the kind of prejudice and racism that um, Leroy experienced. But within the church, mm -hmm. the assumption when you're a follower of Jesus Christ is that the, the family of God would be accepting of you regardless of race and gender um you know that we love one another and yet you were on the end of a lot of animosity and prejudice and racism so you know how did your your calling sustain you and your faith in the lord sustain you during what i imagine were some very lonely days Yes. You know, when I spent uh, a significant period of my time in Hackney and people, young people sometimes would say, oh, the police are racist or, or, you know, older people, I would say to them that the police are not an alien group of people. They are part of the community. And so if we believe the community is racist, then, uh, you know, we can understand why people in the police are racist. And I think the same for the church in that they are not, uh, although we want them to be, we want them to be, as you say, we are people of faith and we should be exercising and showing something different. But again, sinners, uh, they, they, they say the definition of a saint is a sinner who said its prayers. And, and so they are people who are on a journey and who have not learned to let go of their the self and to embrace Christ. And, 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 and that's the big difference, I think. When you have genuinely embraced Christ, when you, to, to embrace Christ, it's this thing about taking up the cross and following. And that means there are certain things that you have to leave behind if you're going to go forward. And, you know, like so many of us, we often, put one foot in and the other foot is still thinking, well, I'm not sure if I can go the whole way. And, and so we end up where we are. But it is nevertheless challenging. And it means that I'm always saying that as a church, we should be able to say, to hold a mirror up to the rest of the community. But we can't hold that mirror up to the community if we don't first hold the mirror up to ourselves challenge ourselves, challenge each other about what it means to be the body of Christ. So I remember in the, my service, my church in Hackney, um, one woman saying to me, the problem is we're not accustomed to people like you being in this role. <laughs> you know, and she was right. They were not accustomed to that. And unfortunately, I only learned this about five years in, or perhaps even just over five years in, that one of my predecessors had said to them that no priest worth anything would want to come to a place like that. And that was sad because as far as they were concerned, their priest that had been with them for 10 years, whom they loved, was right. Not only did they get a woman the first time they were having a woman, but my goodness, they got a black woman. So, you know, they got the dregs of the dregs as far as they were <laughs> concerned. And, and that was difficult. Now, had I been told that right at the beginning, I would have been able to sort of maybe compensate for their behavior a little bit more and not be too hard on them. <laughs> Um, but it's, it's a challenge and, and, and for us, for, for Leroy, for myself and for others, we have to ask the question, who are we in Christ? Because we're not just Rose or Leroy from the block. We are Christian Rose and Christian Leroy from the block, nevertheless. Mm -hmm. And so we have to live that bit differently. We have to live as though we belong to the cross and that it has made a difference in our lives. Mm 
Because if it has not made a difference in our lives, we may as well pack our bags and go home. Yeah, we may yeah. as well take the dog collars out. We may as well put the Bible away. We may as well stop the ritual of going to a place of worship. It makes no sense. What makes sense is when it becomes alive and living in our lives. Yeah. So we have a prayer that we say at the end of each service. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. In other words, we've come in, we have received, but now we've got to get out there into the real world and live what it means to be the people of God. And, and, and so that's, you know, as people will say to me from time to time, Rose, why do you stay with the church? Especially during the tough times. And I would pause and then I would say to them, I stay because I know who has called me. This is not about this church leader or that church leader. No, no, no. This is about God and God's calling and, yeah. and being faithful to that calling. Did you ever doubt that calling? Oh, no. Oh, no. I think there were dark days. There were dark days. But in that darkness, there's a wonderful Old Testament story of Jacob when Jacob was fleeing, um, having um, uh, taken his brother's, um, what do you call it, his, his, his right, um, birthright, and he was fleeing. And, and he came upon this particular place where an angel, I think he, I don't know if he was having a dream, but he was holding on to this angel. And, and he, you know, he was saying, I'm not letting go until you bless me. And that's powerful, pretty powerful. So you see, there's someone who sings a song that says, uh, the God of the day is still God of the night. Mm -hmm. And he says, faith is easy when you're on the mountain. But when you're down in the valley, that's when it's hard. And actually, mm -hmm. that's when we need to know that God is right there in the valley with us. And, and you know... Yeah. We say the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Mm -hmm. And so it's about having that maturity of faith that recognizes that you are not alone. You are being carried by God. He is right there with you through the storms, that wonderful song, through the storms, through the night. Lead me on into the light. Yes. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yes. Leroy, for you, 10 years, you know, uh, the, the first 10 years were really tough and you, you, devoted yourself to be in what you sensed you were called in but you didn't enjoy it it was tough going what there was a key moment 10 years in where tell us about this this pivotal key moment not just in your marriage yeah. uh, and in your faith but also in your perspective on your calling that completely shifted things for you yeah what well, is it was a quite a a sequence of events and you could you don't be a forensic scientist to know when god's dna is somewhere and uh because i actually wanted to join the forensic science section of the met um when i joined to carry on my science but they civilianized the role and that's why i stayed uh i i, I couldn't then leave uh and i thought no let me continue and um but the because I, I had um uh, become a sergeant uh, at this stage and I transferred from Edmonton on a lateral uh, development and to go back to Hackney. And just to pick up uh, Rose's point, um, there's so many people who used, used to fear going to uh, Hackney because they would hear about, oh, you know, black people, they're violent. And, you know, that even before they put a foot on the ground, they already mm -hmm. have got this siege mentality because of what's been passed on by mm -hmm. their colleagues. So um, when I asked to go from Edmund, Edmonton, and uh, Southgate, where I was based, to go to Hackney as a sergeant. They said, why would you do that? You know, that's scary stuff. I thought, no, that's where I want to be. That's where the Lord is telling me to go to. And um, as a result of that, I, um, I I was doing a lot of surveillance work. And unfortunately, when on one of our surveillance um, initiatives, I, I, I 
uh, to confront a, a main suspect who we believe was selling drugs to youngsters. And in fact, we're using the local vicarage to do an observation point. So the, the local vicar <laughs> let us use his office to observe these drug dealers. Anyway, um, in the process of trying to arrest this drug dealer, um, I, I and gave him chase. I, I broke my ankle grappling with him. And it, it, the Lord just sort of put me on a stop. And I thought, wow, wh why would he do that? You know, and that was shortly after um, my w wife had left me and she came back three months later and she said, listen, we can only have this marriage if God's in the center of it. And, I, and, I, and then we became born again Christians together um, in that church. And, and then this, and I thought, Lord, is this how you're going to repay me? You break my ankle? <laughs> I mean, come on. And he just stopped. And, but what he did, he, he gave me a time to say, I want you to know what your calling is. Because you're just doing all sorts of stuff in the police, great stuff, but you need to know what it is. And this time, I, I was involved in setting up the Black Police Association. We hadn't launched then because this was now sort of April, May of, of 94. And we were looking at launching in September of that year. And uh, uh, a brother, um, Rob Neal, he might be tuning in. Um, he told me about um, Jesse Jackson was going to be speaking at uh, Bloomsby Baptist Church uh, to commemorate um, Martin Luther King had spoken there 30 years earlier in 1964. And it was the only church he actually spoke at as a sermon. And I was sitting there in the pews and um, he spoke about Romans 12, not to conform with this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And it, it just went bam. It was literally, it, it, that was my Damascus Road experience. I was sitting there and I was so, that was it. Lord wanted to stop, reflect, know who he is, and then honor him and he will honor you. In honour of him, in honour of me and others who do likewise. And as a result of that, I thought, this is my mission, to change how I was going to make changes from within the organisation through the Black Police Association. And I knew it wasn't going to be um, maybe a few years after we launched uh, in that September of 94. It might take 10 years, but I was there for the long haul. And for me, it, 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 it was clear that, we had an opportunity to make changes for the for the better. And that actually came faster than I thought, because in 1998, myself and two other members of the Black Police Association gave evidence at the McPherson inquiry looking into the death of um, Stephen Lawrence. And I remember giving evidence and saying that police were institutionally racist. And I remember hearing the senior officers behind us just thinking, oh, no. And you could hear them tutting and everything. And I thought, wow, we are now going to be on people's target. But there was no fear. It, it was, for me, this was what I was there to do. And this was my mission. And I, I, and I, I always felt whatever it was the Lord has asked me to do, I would claim that ground. So that was holy ground. So in, in entering any issue, whether it's dealing with a home secretary or the commissioner or anyone else, if he's going to put me in that place of power or those corridors of power, he would, I would claim that as holy ground. Because when I'm entering, I've got the army of saints, the royal priesthood following me in. So I've outnumbered them already. And, and that gave me that sense of, I, you know, no weapon formed against me will prosper. And I did not have any fear. I, I might not be as experienced of them, but the Lord was going to give me the wisdom to know I'll, I'll, I'll speak a word in season. To, to bring in a, a new um, response, something that will get to think and, and, and around the systemic failures, the institutional racism and other prejudices that was in the organisation. Bishop Rose, for you, your vision, what God had given you as a young 14-year-old girl was something that didn't exist in England. I mean, you'd seen women where you grew up who were in positions of influence, and so you knew it could happen, but yes. you weren't 
you were now living in England um, yes. and you were working in, in the UK and there were not a lot of people who looked like you in positions of influence, certainly not within the church. Mm. And so how did you maintain just a sense of hope for something that would change when you're talking about 40 years before mm. you actually yes. almost before you really begin to walk in the fulfillment of that vision? How do yes. you remain faithful? Well, if you think uh, the children of Israel, 40 years, they wandered in <laughs> the desert. <laughs> they all died the out, out, apart from Caleb and Joshua. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to get to the promised land. <laughs> you know, I, I always, normally when I introduce myself at, at functions, I would say to them, that I had the good fortune of being born and brought up in Jamaica. Because when you're born there and brought up there, you see images of yourself in all walks of life. So you know that you are, you're not a figment of your imagination. You know, uh, you walk down the street, you look at a bookshop, and there on the covers of the books, you see faces that looks like you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you know, in the school books, the ordinary books, and and you see people like you in all walks of life, and then you come to this country, which is a predominantly European country, yes, but nevertheless, there are significant uh, numbers of minority ethnic people in some of our inner cities, in, in Liverpool, Manchester, uh, Bristol, London, etc. But you don't see people who look like you walking the corridors of power or in leadership roles and responses and that can have an impact on you if you weren't if you have not been brought up where you can see it and know and you are here in this country where you don't see it then it does something to your psyche i think it does something to our children's psyche not to have had that and so I, I think for me, with coming from that background, I always knew that it was possible. Mm -hmm. And I always knew that I do not allow other people to tell me that I'm of no value or of no worth. Toppled, topped with that is, of course, the fact that my worth is in Christ. Mm -hmm. And so those two things are two very powerful things and that really sustains you. And, and also to recognize that we come from a people, a people who didn't just sort of, you know, wake up tomorrow or yesterday and, and they're here. No, no, we come from a generation of survivors, a generation of people who are beaten down and yet we still stand up, a generation of people who knew that there was a God, that there is a God, and, and that they needed to trust in that God. And so, in a sense, what happens is that you carry that. You carry the, the soul, the, the songs of the, um, the ancestors and the spirituals. You carry that with you. And as my brother Leroy said, when he spoke about the host of people who are already there with him, mm -hmm. so he's not alone. Mm -hmm. When you have a sense of that, it makes a difference. It makes a real difference mm -hmm. because you keep walking. You say, Lord, we've made that promise. I believe you. You're going to work it out. I don't need to do anything. I don't need to boast. I don't need to. So when I first offered myself for ordination training in this country, I was told that I needed to be at home looking after my daughter and my husband. My response to them was my husband is perfectly capable of looking after himself. <laughs> <laughs> and had I not thought how I would manage with my child, I would not have offered. So there was no sense of, we don't have many black people in leadership. You know, let's test her. There was none of that. You, you, do we really want, do we want him? No, 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 she doesn't look like us. She doesn't sound like us, you know? So, so, but then you still, when you are pushed away like that, you still have to go away and say, God, did I get it wrong? Did I get your calling wrong? No, 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 no. I believe you called me. And each time, each time when somebody says, I don't want you because you're black or you're a woman, 
you know, you go away and you think, wow, that hurts. But actually, it is their loss. It is their loss. So you pull yourself together again because Christ is with you and you can keep going. You can keep stepping forward, but you have to remain connected to Christ. You loosen that connection and you fall because the weight of it alone breaks you. And so you have to stay connected. Somebody once I gathered said that Christianity was a, a, a crook. And the response came back was, well, if you've broken your leg and the only way you can get from A to B is to have a crook to help you walk, are you going to say, oh, no, I'm not going to do that? Because, no, no, you're going to get that and you're going to walk. Well, we're staying, I'm staying hooked up to Christ because I know that that is what has seen me through the storms of life. He has been, God has been the anchor, the anchor. And also I've seen it. I've seen it for my people. I have seen it for my people. And so I know, you know, it's not a figment of my imagination, you know. So, yeah, I keep going. Mm. What about um, the the pursuit of getting to where you are now? I don't know if that's the right word, but were you ever tempted to settle in a role? I mean, you achieved some incredible firsts. And I know that you often talk about how you long for the day when you will not be the first any longer when this will be the norm but you know you were already the first black deacon or one of the first women deacons you were uh, you know priest chaplain to the queen and the speaker of the house of commons in all of the in all of your journey was there not a time where you felt like this this is good enough i mean this is pretty impressive i'm okay with this gosh no no i think the only time i've ever felt Wow, is when I had my children. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, when I had my children. But no, seriously, it, it, it's been a journey. And I think the Christian faith is about being on a journey. And the minute you think that you have arrived, you're in the wrong place. So it's, you know, and, and, and certainly in the Gospels, when Jesus tells the disciples, when he sends the 70 out, he was telling them to travel lightly. Don't weigh yourself down with everything that you think you need, because it, it, at any moment now, he's going to tell you it's time to move on. So, so it's not for us to, to bed ourselves down and to feel too comfortable. This is an itinerant rule. And we must be ready to be called, to move, to go, to be sent at, at any time. So, we, you know, I often see what I'm doing as I'm passing through. But, you know, while I'm passing through, I'm going to do a darn good job. Because if, if I don't do a good job, then, you know, a mediocre white man who is in a role, nobody says when, when they've gone, oh, we, we'd better not have another man because they don't say that. But let it be a woman and let it be mm -hmm. someone black. Oh, we tried one of those before. Let, let's not, you know. <laughs> so, so we can't afford to be mediocre. Mediocrity is not in our books. It is not an option. <laughs> you can be damn good all the time. Uh, as you have proved. Can I, can I just build up on that? Because it ties in with uh, what Rose was saying, um, being in, in Jamaica and, and seeing it, certain things and being it, there's not a big gap. And I think that that's what I actually benefited from when I went to um, Jamaica for um, a few years in my primary school age. And I saw black teachers, black doctors, black prime ministers and black police officers. So... And I felt an advantage that mm. I was able to be whatever I wanted to be. Because even, even some of my colleagues at school, they would say to me, oh, um, you, you want to be well, a scientist? Oh, we don't do that, man. What's wrong with it? And then the careers teacher would be saying that to us. No, 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 we don't. Do, no, no. Could you think of something a bit more um, achievable? No, I have seen it. So please don't tell me I can't. I can't do it. And they all look like me. And, mm. and, and that's why I think it's so key. And, and if, if, if there's a, a stage where I believe um, a child 
needs to have that cultural immersion. If they don't get it in their home, mm -hmm. is to take them back and let them sense that because mm -hmm. they should get it in their home, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's not, not always um, possible. But that, that I think is, is really important. And then that gives you that, that sense of excellence because in Jamaica, you know, I remember going back to Jamaica and I used to talk a lot. Well, that was stopped very quickly. You couldn't be talking in class. So you had to be excellent. You had to put your homework in on time. You know, you had, when you finished school, you had certain things you had to do, certain chores. And that that came with me back to England when I came back to finish off primary school and going to secondary school and, and, and do my degree. I had certain things I had to do. And that discipline, Mm -hmm. Gave that sense of excellence, which I, mm -hmm. I, I couldn't get anywhere else. Mm -hmm. and, and, and unfortunately, sometimes within our community, if our parents' generation have been badly damaged by the system, the structures, then it means that the, the next generation coming up just, you know, they haven't got the people to look up to, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And so we need to change that so that they can. And, and, and find their way through it. Well, as a final word from both of you, uh, Dr. Leroy and Bishop Rose, you know, today both of you stand as incredible pillars in our society. I just feel so humbled that we have both of you in this conversation. Uh, I, I also feel a tremendous sense of hope hearing you speak, uh, hope for the future. When I look at you, when I listen to you, I feel excited for the future of this nation um, and globally as well. But given the challenging year that we've had, 2020, how does your faith in God bolster you as you look to the future, especially with regards to you know, the next generation of leaders? Well, let, 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 me, let me start by saying that um, Throughout my career, every time I called on the Lord, he would turn up and he would put people in the right place at the right time. And Rose is no exception because I remember going to Hackney and I had really, I didn't have the sufficient operational experience because I, I went on promotion um, from chief inspector in central London to superintendent. And I knew it was one of the most challenging boroughs in the country and I felt, wow, Lord, you want me to be there, so you've got to equip me. And, and not just with my skills and abilities and my confidence through my faith and the, the, the fruits of the labor that you want me to show, but more importantly, provide the right sort of people. And I remember when I went to Hackney and I met Rose for the first time and uh, it was about 2004, and we had critical incidences. And mm. if there was a stabbing or shooting, my first port of call was Rose. Now, part of my goal group, Rose. You know, it's, and, and not only just to give strategic advice and, and guidance on how to deal with it, but she would be um, creating that calm for the community so that it wouldn't be feuds and, and retribution. And, and that, that permeated into the the my officers because they would say wow have you seen that that pastor down the road she's amazing you know because that and, and i think that for me um really shows you know if you really are discerning and you really have got your spiritual antennae watching you because you might walk past certain people i think oh we did no but if you've got that real lens and that real antennae looking and you spot people like rose and you think wow that is someone I need to cling on tight to, not you know, spiritually, but also in terms of just uh, a presence and 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 dealing with things. And and I think just just the the test that she's gone through inspires me because I, I remember when um, um, she told me about she was going for the the chaplain role to the speaker, and uh, and you know, and she asked me to be. Uh, a referee and I thought wow just little old me to be a referee <laughs> but I'll do it I'll, I'll put it on my CV actually I, I referee <laughs> you know? and um no I, and, and I thought you know especially there, there were so much challenges in the palace of Westminster and I know officers who really were challenged 
you know, especially with Keith Palmer, who was stabbed mm. to death in the confines of Parliament. And I know officers still speak about how Rose was salt and light. She was that presence of grace to, you know, and MPs still speak about that. So for me, it's 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 not just about what you do uh, for in in your purpose and the mission that the Lord has given you to do, but also the people that you are, are linked with and, and it helps you to weather the storm. So even now with COVID and the challenges, you know, fellowship is a key to all of this. You know, if you don't have family and, and, and your nearest and dearest to be with you, please ask for fellowship and, 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 and friendship. And whether it's on social media or whatever you, you can do to connect with people, I think it, that is a, a really important part of it. We're, we're not um, individuals. We're, we're spiritual beings and we're supposed to be in fellowship. And I, for me, that, that's one of the things that gets me through these challenges is to be able to talk things through. I mean, what, my biggest um, fellowship warrior is my wife. She's my prayer warrior. She spends more time praying for me and saying listen make sure this man connects and does you know but and and and, and i've got a prayerful daughter you know and, and my sons as well you know we, we that that's the solidarity i i think is so key mm -hmm. and we cannot underestimate that we could easily overlook it and and time and time again the lord sort of slaps me on the wrist uh oh get this right don't forget this and you know it's it's, it's a struggle it's not perfect but, you know, the priorities are there and I think it's important that we don't overlook it. And I think if I could just add very briefly to say that um, the coronavirus pandemic that has hit us this year has, I hope, taught us one thing. And that one thing is that humanity belongs together, that we cannot build walls. I know there are some people uh, who have not learned that lesson. We cannot build walls or create artificial boundaries. And the pandemic has taught us that, you know, we are interdependent and that we need to reach out to one another in a way that shows value and respect for each other's humanity. The South African word, which you probably will know much better than I do, um, Ruth, Ubuntu, Ubuntu. I am because you are. I am because you are. And you know, we are inter we are interrelated to one another. And and I just hope and pray that it is a lesson that will not be lost as we go down the Brexit route, uh, um, etc. Yes. <laughs> Don't say the B word. Don't say the B word. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's been so lovely having you um, both. Thank you so much. You've been listening into Power of Faith, How to Triumph in Challenging Times. And my guests tonight have been Dr. Leroy Logan, MBE, and the Right Reverend Bishop Rose Hudson Wilkins, CD, MBE. Thank you so much for your time and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, Ruth. It's excellent. Thank you.